Uh, so, yep. Yeah. Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is Maciek, and I come from the co company called Creepup, where we specialize in AI and machine learning and cloud native technologies. And um, today, I'd like to begin with the with a smart quote quote brought to us by Joseph Pironas. Um, uh, he basically said that if we're engineering the processes and the solution that are not not automatable. We continue having to staff humans to maintain the system. If we have to staff human to do the work, we are feeding the machine with the blood, sweat, and tears of human beings. Think matrix with less special efforts, uh, effects and more pissed off system administrators. Uh, the quote uh, comes from the Google SRE book, which I highly rec recommend. Uh, and I've put it here because in my, in, in my honest opinion, it is brilliant because it explains in a simple words how important is uh, automation nowadays. And I would like uh, the notion of this code to be a life motif of this presentation. And of course, uh, this is the actual, actual topic, uh, lecture topic, uh, which you should already know. I'm, uh, today I'm gonna say a few words about um, how I understand infrastructure as a code, and later on I will gently fill you in when with uh, one of the infrastructure infrastructure as a code solutions, which is Amazon Web Services Cloud Formation. And uh, worth mentioning is that um, is that um, throughout the presentation I'm going to use the AWS Cloud concepts and the nomenclature. So the basic uh, basic cloud computing knowledge or AWS knowledge would be uh, would be uh, great would help to understand the content. So um, before we actually get to the remedy, uh, which is of course infrastructure as a code, uh, I would like to um, it would be great to recall the reasons why something like uh, infrastructure as a code even came up. So uh, I'm seeing, I've, I'm sure you've seen such uh, articles many times in your life before. Someone got built for 14K. Uh, some service is down for a week uh, because of the because AWS data center uh, went down, or even some data center sometimes burns down. And um, there is one thing that people who got affected by this situation have in common. They have never asked themselves a question. What would happen if these things happen? And uh, they have never thought how much the infrastructure really costs or what they're going to do when their data, data center burns down. Uh, yeah, uh, so why such a situation happens? Well, pessimists might say it's just, it's just a Murphy's law. <laughs> so that um, it says that basically anything that cannot go wrong will eventually go wrong. But uh, the question which arises, of course, is how do we prevent such a, such a situation to happen? And well, of course, a simple answer to that is infrastructure as a code. And to describe the foundation of infrastructure as a, as a code, we can use a metaphor and compare it to uh, modern factories where the machines are, the ma ma are mainly responsible for assembling a car. The person actually just has to provide the appropriate parts and um, the construction part actually is automated by the machines. And by infrastructure as a code, we as a developers or DevOpsists, we would like to do the same. We would like to like the machines to fold, uh, to assemble our infrastructure for us while we're, we are drinking our coffees. And uh, infrastructure as a code is nothing more than a set of rules that tells you um, how to automate the infrastructure, um, how to automate the infrastructure. Referring it to the factory, it tells us what parts, parts to provide and how to provide them. One of the main objective, of course, is to, is to handle the infrastructure deployment in a similar, similar fashion we used to automate uh, application deployment. Okay, uh, before we actually move uh, to infrastructure as a code in practice, practice, let's recall how our infrastructure setup looked in pre-automation era. So this is most probably how your life looks like now. You usually open AWS console, you create some VPCs, VMs, 
uh, you forgot to create a security group. So you do that, you create an adequate base, et cetera, et cetera, lots of clicking. So, and, and this is how your life will look like after this presentation. We're going to use um, AWS CLI along with Platformation. And with a simple command, we'll create something that is called stack, which I'll describe, describe later. Uh, we're going to use a single YAML file, file and we're going to name the stack infrastructure and launch it in one of the EU AWS region. In this particular case, it's, uh, it's going to be a Frankfurt region. And when I click enter, our, inf our infrastructure will appear. And after our work is done and we don't need our infra anymore, we'll use a single delete stack command so that we can easily delete all of the infrastructure we created beforehand. These basically, uh, these commands are the crux of this presentation and we'll use them later on. Okay, so how do I do that and how it actually works? And um, I'd like to explain this with a metaphor. And the metaphor will of course be a cooking process. Today we'll cook a dish that's called Polish calamaris. And the question is what it takes to prepare such a sophisticated dish? What is the cooking algorithm and what elements do we need to make a dish? Well, in my honest opinion, cooking process might be divided into three main elements, ingredients, method, and a cook. Um, for Polish calamaris, we need two sausages, some water, and some beans. We also need to have a method, which is like an algorithm. And last but not least, we have the cook, that the cook that who will use the method to turn the ingredients into uh, into an actual dish. And why am I talking about this? Well, because this is exactly the way the infrastructure as a code works. To have the automated infrastructure, which follows the, the AAC guidelines, we need these three elements, the ingredients. So in our case, this is going to be the description of our, of our cloud resources in a text format. The method, so the algorithm that uh, tells us how to run these, and a cook, so the software that will take the resources description, um, that will take the resources description, an algorithm, and turn them into an actual cloud resources. Happily, happily, these two elements are handled for us by AWS, and the only thing that's left is to prepare the ing ingredients, and that's what we're gonna do in a while. We will prepare the ingredients, so the text files that describe our infrastructure. Okay, enough of theory. Let's uh, start leaning towards the practical use case. And uh, as aforementioned, as for mentioned, ingredients uh, are in fact description of cloud resources we need to use. And when I say descriptions, I, I really mean descriptions in a text format. Same like an um, application code is written in pro some programming languages like Java or C++ to implement our infrastructure. So virtual machines, network databases, we can either use JSON or YAML format. Such files containing JSON or YAML code are called cloud formation scripts. And cloud formation script itself actually consists of a few elements. Uh, we're gonna go over a few of these elements one by one so that you won't get confused. And we're gonna create a simple cloud formation script that consists of a few basic AWS resources, um, that is VPC, uh, subnet, and a security group. So what are uh, the building blocks of cloud formation script? Where, well, first and foremost, and the outermost element is the concept called template. And in a simple words, it's just a YAML file, YAML or JSON file, that serves as a bucket for the rest of the cloud formation elements. And it looks like, pretty much looks like this. Uh, let me know if the font size is, is, is well. Yeah, Can you see right. everything? Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, it looks like, looks like this. Note that of course, beside the file, we also, we also have some preamble inside. 
these are really negligible at this point, but we have the template version and the description of what's going to be inside the template. And the next element, the next element and the heart of the source of the um, cloud formation group is the resources section. This uh, YAML object will contain the definitions of our cloud resources. The key uh, will be our internal name of the resource and the value will be the actual resource definition. For starters, let's put a VPC uh, in there. VPC, so the isolated virtual network. Okay, first off, we of course have to start with putting a resources section right there. So here we are. Uh, as I said, we start with the, with the name of the resource. This is just our internal name. So let's, let's name it my VPC. Um, next, we have to pinpoint that the resource we want is actually VPC. To do it, we have to define type, which is mandatory element of each cloud formation resource. So let's do it, type, and the type is going to be AWS EC2 um, VPC, of course. Okay, the next um, mandatory element uh, is, uh, is property section. Each resource, of course, will have its own set of fixed properties. Uh, let's put properties in there. Um, and if, in case of VPC, the only mandatory property uh, is the cider block. So let's put it there and define it as 10.0.0.0 with a mask of 22. And actually at this point, we already have a proper cloud formation script uh, that will automatically create a VPC for us. Um, so let's do it. Let's create the VPC. I'm going to use the command that I've shown you beforehand. I just, I'll just um, paste it into the terminal. Enter. Okay, uh, WSCLI returns the stack ID. It means that the script was accepted by CloudFormation. And now we can move to the CloudFormation UI. Here we are. We can see that we have one stack in place. It's called infrastructure, as I said beforehand. And it's already uh, it's already 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 created. We can see that there is the description we put uh, in the cloud formation script uh, and the stack identifier. And in the resources tab, we can see that uh, our VPC is in here. Okay, let's get back to the code. Um, of course, except the VPC, we need uh, some subnet inside. So let's let's put it there. Let's name it my subnet. Uh, we have of course defined. Uh, we have to define the obligatory type. In this case, this is going to be AWS EC2 subnet. Mandatory properties block, of course. And uh, in this case, this is going to be the mandatory properties for the subnet are CIDR block again and the VPC ID. Um, let's put a CIDR block there. Uh, we have to remember that the, that the CIDR block of the PC, VPC have to be inside the, the of the subnet have, has to be inside the, the VPC side uh, block. So let's define it with a mask of 24. And the next required property is of course, as I said, VPC ID. And this one is uh, interesting because uh, to define it, we're gonna use um, uh, something that's called intrinsic function. Of course, the value should be the identifier of the VPC that we just created above. Okay, so we so we need to have some kind of function that will reference the ID of the VPC. And uh, of course, to do that, we're going to use a reference function. And the syntax goes like this, exclamation mark ref, 
and our internal, internal name of the VPC. And again, at this point, we should be ready to create, uh, it should be good to create, uh, uh, to update the stack. So I'll just type update here, click enter. Okay, CloudFormation accepted the script. So let's see it in our UI, CloudFormation UI, refresh. Yes, and we can see that my VPC is already created, by, but my subnet is currently being created. Okay, moving on to the next resource and the last resource we're gonna to create, this will be an EC2 machine. An EC2 machine, so of course the virtual machine. Uh, let's name it my uh, EC2. Again, we have to define a type. I'll just copy it. And in our case, the, uh, in this case, the type will be the instance, so EC2 instance. And um, first required property of the EC2 instance, um, the first required property will be the instance type. So we will use the dual core one gigabyte of RAM machine, which in um, AWS nomenclature is called T3 micro. Instance type T3 dot micro. Okay. And uh, next we have to pinpoint the operating system in image. Then the name of the property is image ID. And the value, value is, of course, the identifier of the image. Now uh, we have to find, find out what's the identifier of the operating system image that we're going to use. So let's see if we can find it in AWS console. Uh, I can open the EC2 dashboard, click launch instance. And in here, we can see the list of available uh, let's say operating system images. Uh, this is called in Amazon, this is called AMI, so Amazon machine image. And we can see that the, uh, in each row, there is an identifier in here. So let's say I'm going to use uh, the first one. So Amazon uh, Linux two image. So let's put it here, okay. And of course, uh, since we would like to run our EC2 machine inside of our subnet we just created, uh, we need to use an optional property called subnet ID. Uh, again, we're gonna use a reference function to do that. And in this time we are going to reference the subnet that we just created above. So reference my subnet. Okay, let's update the stack. Oh, seems to work. Uh, let's see how it looks like in here. Yep, and we can see that our EC2 machine is uh, being created. And of course the subnet that we created beforehand is already in place. Uh, okay, this was the last resource, resource that I wanted to, uh, to create now. Uh, if in future you'll need a comprehensive documentation about specific AWS resource and its mandatory properties, you can just Google the resource name with a cloud formation suffix, uh, just like this, let's say EC2 cloud formation, and there it is, like a comprehensive AWS documentation. Yeah, and here you can see that there are many properties that you can use to uh, to define an EC2 machine. Okay. Okay, so we went through the template and the resources. And the next section of the cloud formation script are the um, script parameters. Of course, each script might, might be parameterized and we can use uh, such parameters to, for example, uh, create a copy of our, of our infrastructure with some customized setting just for testing purposes. Uh, for example, uh, let's, let's parameterize the CIDR block. Uh, to do it, 
first we have to define the parameter sections. And inside of the parameter section, the key should be the parameter name and the value will contain the parameter definition. So in our case, we're going to parameterize a VPC cider block. So let's put them VPC cider block variable name. And inside we have the definition. And uh, one property of the definition is of course the type. So in our case, this is going to be a string. And uh, also we can define the default value. And this is going to be the value that we used until now. <laughs> okay. And the last step is just to reference this parameter here with a, again, reference function. Okay, that's cool. And uh, now we can create a twin VPC, uh, twin, twin stack de facto. Uh, I'm gonna use the command I've prepared beforehand, uh, before the lecture. The command contains an additional option, dash dash parameters, uh, which I, uh, in which I define the new value of our cider block parameter. You can see it here. Also, uh, I've changed the name so, to the infrastructure version two, so that we have a copy of our infrastructure, not to avoid uh, replacing the actual infrastructure, but to have a copy of the infrastructure instead. Okay, let's uh, paste it here into the terminal. Okay, and we see the typo. I've put a default with a lowercase. It should be uppercase. Let's see if it works now. Okay, yeah, we can see the stack, uh, stack ID. So CloudFormation accepted this, the script. And let's see what's going on in the CloudFormation UI. Let's refresh it. Yep, and we can see that infrastructure version two is being, um, is being created uh, with our VPC CIDR block modified. Uh, okay, the last thing that I want to show you is the output section, outputs element, whatever. This time uh, I will start with AWS console. So let's move it, move there, okay. Um, and as you can see here, uh, we have all the information about our stacks uh, in here, and we have the output section, al section also, uh, which is basically empty. Uh, it means that our stack does not expose any internal information to the outside world. However, having such information uh, might be helpful. For example, in case you would like other stacks to consume the data uh, from the infrastructure stack, or you simply would like to see the identifier of the resource uh, to easily find it in the AWS console. We can, of course, achieve it by including the output section into our CloudFormation script. And it goes like this. Of course, outputs. Okay, um, and then the variable name, the output variable name. Uh, so let's say we're going to output uh, VPC identifier, VPC ID, and the value here will be the, the value, the definition of the value. And to have the value of the VPC ID, Again, we can use the reference function the same way we did it for submit. Okay, let me update the stack. Let's see if it works. Okay, but the script was accepted. I'm going to refresh it. And here we are. We can see that the VPC ID is here and the value is outputted. Okay, uh, going back to the presentation, of course, um, of course, there are, these are not the only AW, uh, CloudFormation elements sections available uh, because uh, besides 
these, we also have a metadata section, rules section, uh, conditions sections, mapping, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, Unfortunately, I had to skip these for the brevity of this presentation. In case you're interested in the template anatomy, you can find a nice piece of AWS documentation at the following link. And uh, don't worry, I'll include the link on the last slide. Okay, so here we are. This is the full picture of the cloud formation elements that I wanted you to uh, that I wanted you to sh show you today. And I would like to add one more thing. Uh, you should remember that what I've shown you today is just the tip of the iceberg. The cloud formation is much more than what I've shown today. And if you would like to just take a little bit deeper dive into cloud formation, together with Michal Kapiczyński, my colleague from GrayPub, uh, we prepared a series of articles about the enterprise, uh, great, enterprise great infrastructure setup. The, the articles guide you through both manual and automated setup based on cloud formation. An example shown there, of course, is, is much more complex. Uh, both guides, manual and automated, are also available in form of an ebook on a grape up website. So if you're interested, the link uh, will be available on the last slide. And um, I know that all of this might look uh, complex at this point, but believe me, once you delve into infrastructure as a code, you will feel like a Fred Flintstone who changed his vehicles to the newest Mercedes G-Class. And uh, as we approach the end of this presentation, I'd like to, uh, to quickly, quickly sum up the benefits that infrastructure as a code uh, gives us. So uh, first element is the disaster recovery. As you've already seen today, where we were able to spin up a twin infrastructure in just a few seconds. So uh, if that's the case, similarly, we could spin up the same infra infrastructure in another AWS region in a second. So for example, in London or, or Ireland instead of Frankfurt. It means that uh, we can cl quickly recover in, ca in case something bad happens to one of the AWS data centers. The next element is the CICD. Note that the valid infrastructure as a code script is basically a foundation for, a, for a proper CICD process. Uh, we saw an example today. We were able to boot up our infrastructure on demand just to test our code changes. Uh, we could implement the same thing in CI pipeline and run such tests before we push the code to, to production. Next element is uh, repeatable deployments. This one is closely connected to continuous deployment, but it's worth noticing. Once we get rid of human-driven the deployments, human-driven deployments, so uh, quoting, we stop feeding the machine with the blood, sweat, and tears of human beings, uh, and we'll use the, the same infrastructure as a code script over and over again, we basically eliminate human factor, um, which unfortunately uh, in most cases uh, causes the issues. Um, okay, the next point is the idempotent infrastructure. This is actually a nice feature um, that most of the infrastructure of the code tools offer. Uh, the basically idempotency means that no matter how many times uh, you run your uh, script, infrastructure as a code script, um, uh, no matter how many times you run it, um, and what is your start starting state, you will always end up with the, the same end state. So this simplifies the provisioning, provisioning of the infrastructure and reduces the chances of the inconsistent results. And last but not least, of course, versioning audit. Uh, so since guiding principle of infrastructure as a code is to keep your scripts in a version control system like a Git, uh, you get versioning and audit out of the box. Okay, uh, that's all I've prepared for today. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I'm leaving, leaving you with another smart code, and I think we can I think we can move now to Q and A.